Well, we're going to be in two texts this evening. It's going to be Acts chapter 6 and 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy, you're about, I don't know, millionth Timothy or something like that. So, 1 Timothy. Acts chapter 6 and 1 Timothy. I wish Taj and Charlie and Anthony would have told me it was Grace suit day. They didn't let me know. And even Lee's kind of got that, you know, dark earthy tone to him. But uh, sometimes pastors last to know. <laughs> Acts chapter 6. Todd's got his Donald Trump tie on over there. I called him a Trump supporter in the middle of Safeway this morning. Boy, everybody looked at him. <laughs> you ever want to have fun with somebody? Just accuse them of being a Trump supporter and pretend not to believe them if they claim they're not. It doesn't really matter if they are or not. It has nothing to do with it. <laughs> if they are, they won't admit it. And if, they, uh, if they're not, it'll offend them. So either way, that has nothing to do with anything. I was just thinking about my millennial thing this morning. I, had, I kind of let, let off on the millennials a little bit. You guys notice that? I left them alone. Because I, I like millennials. But that radio announcer got me so badly yesterday when he categorized you know, uh, children, adults, and millennials. And <laughs> I, just, I didn't know what to do with it. You know, I thought, wow, when do, when do you age out, you know, when it's your generation? So you'll always be like a separate category, subhuman or extrahuman or something. I don't know. So, poor guys. Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6 tonight. And yeah, though you're fooling around joking about things, a bit ago, but now we'll be in the Word of God, and so this is all serious. And uh, no joke here, this is some important, some important truth. And I want to look at the first eight verses. The Bible says, In those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, it is not reason that we should leave the Word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. And the same pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. <clears throat> and the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Now we'll pray. We'll ask the Lord to help us with our understanding again this evening. Father, we do need help. Uh, first of all, at the end of the day, to even be able to be alert, to focus. And I just ask that our thinking would be shaped this evening about church polity, about the way that you would have a church to be formed up and developed and leadership to grow. And I pray that this evening that we would understand fully uh, the responsibilities and the benefits of the office of the deacon. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm going to preach just a really simple message this evening. Before we do that, I want to give you a little bit of a background or a basis for where we are coming from. Sometimes we take too much on ourselves as individuals to the degree or meaning that sometimes we think that we're indispensable. Sometimes we think, well, uh, you know, I'm always going to be here, I'll always be doing this. Or sometimes we even adopt the notion that if I'm not here, life will not go on. Some years ago it occurred to me that the world had rotated on its axis just as God uh, set it in motion uh, a number of years before I'd ever been born. Now, I hadn't noticed it before I was born, but the earth was revolving, it was rotating, and actually uh, it's been set in perfect balance from the moment God started its spinning. And I, the reason I say that is because sometimes we do adopt the mindset that without us, I mean, what, what is the future? Without us, you know, what would happen? And it is true that if we're serving the Lord and we are fulfilling the purpose that God has made us for, then our purpose will be meaningful. 
the notion that a believer should exist doing something that it's not necessary to be done. Performing service for the Lord, that it's all the same whether it is accomplished or not, is foolish, actually, if you think about it. God created us for a purpose, and the purpose is to serve Him. And if we're serving Him, it will make a difference. I, I realized a long time ago that God isn't just playing games with the preaching of the Gospel and with the call of the saints. I, I, I've said this a lot. It really has impacted me for the entirety of my ministry that uh, I remember preparing for the ministry and having God's call in my life and being excited about the future and what God might do and the dreams and the visions that God gives a young man of being a pastor and serving and planting a church and things that God placed in my heart. And having older men uh, try to give you a little bit of a reality check. And they would say things like this to me when I was uh, preparing for the ministry. They'd say, you know, it's not like it used to be. When you used to preach the gospel, people got saved and it just didn't take much of anything for the church to grow. But, you know, those, those days are past. And they'd say, we're living in the last days. And, you know, they would talk about how that the reception to the gospel is not the way that it used to be, that men are colder than they used to be. And people don't get saved as readily as they used to. And it occurred to me a few years after hearing that and having kind of water being put on your fire just a little bit, it occurred to me that if God were finished with the business of saving people, He'd quit making people preach the gospel. Isn't that true? Whereas if God isn't going to do anything, He's not in heaven playing silly games saying, go and preach the gospel to every creature. They won't believe it. They won't receive it, but do it anyway. No, He promised us not only that the gospel would be effective, He promised His, His power. And when God called us to preach the gospel, He called us to be empowered. And let me just tell you something, my friend. If you'll preach the gospel, people will get saved. And if people get saved and you do right by them and fulfill the great commission of teaching them to observe all things and baptizing them, they will grow. And the church will have a future, and the future will go beyond your generation. Matter of fact, those same individuals that God uses you to preach the gospel and see saved, discipled, and grow, God will use them to do the same thing to the next generation. And it will go on and on and on. God's plan works. Now, having said that and qualified that, we're in Acts chapter 6 and 1 Timothy 3, Daniel. I know you're waiting for a hint on the text, so I'll just give you an overt one. Uh, having said that, I think that in the church sometimes we haven't a clue about how the church is supposed to go on or how it's supposed to carry on. One of the things that I feel burdened for is to make sure that people know what to do in my absence. And I don't know how to put it any other way. You say, Pastor, uh, do you think that you're going to be absent soon? Well, you know, I've been having these chest pains. And so, <laughs> I shouldn't say it in front of my wife. <laughs> I'll get life insurance before I start having chest pains. Okay, baby. All right. But, I, but I'm going to be 40 here in about, a, in a, what is it, two months? So, you know, it's, I'm bound to keel over anytime. So, uh, <laughs> reality of it is, <laughs> sorry, baby, I'm going. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, the, the reality of it is, is that it really doesn't matter. You don't need something to happen to me for you to need to know what to do as far as how to carry out the form uh, and function of a church. And there are offices in the church. And the question is, have you ever thought about how a church gets a pastor or how a church gets its deacons? Now, I'm not saying, do you know how some churches do it? Because a lot of churches do things a lot of different ways. I have seen churches that get a pastors and deacons and they do it in very unorthodox ways. As a matter of fact, uh, in the recent history in our town, some of the large churches, the semi-mega churches and mega churches have uh, lost their pastors suddenly. And, you know, I've watched them replace their pastors and I don't see anything about what the Bible says in Acts in the way they do it. They may get a new pastor or they may call him a pastor, but it isn't done the Bible way. And as far as deacons go, uh, it isn't done the Bible way either. And so there are some things that I'd like to cover this evening because I'd like you to know uh, how it is that a church gets its deacons and how it is that a church gets its pastor. And I think that would be practical, particularly this evening, the matter of the deacon. And so I want to look at two things in particular about the deacon. 
Uh, first of all, I want to look at just how a church gets a deacon. Then I want to look at the blessings for being a, uh, of being a deacon. Now, I have evolved in this matter uh, of wanting deacons in our church over the years. Not needing deacons, I say wanting deacons uh, for this reason. Now, I realized early on in the ministry that churches have a lot of problems having things for the sake of having them. Uh, for instance, have you been to a church that has a choir uh, because churches are supposed to have a choir? But to be really honest about it, it'd be better if they didn't have a choir. You know, they have specials every Sunday. You know, we're going to have two specials every service. And they have a couple specials every service, but they're not that special. Maybe they're really special, but not in a good way. Uh, you know, uh, because it's just what we do. And churches fall in the rut of that. And churches oftentimes every year elect deacons. I've seen churches literally go through political problems. I mean, have political upheaval because they have to have deacons and they elect them, but they don't do it the Bible way. And when you don't do things the Bible way, you have problems. By the time we come to the stage of where the church is at in the text we read tonight in Acts chapter 6, the church in, the, the Jerusalem church has grown at least to 20,000 people, probably pushing 50,000 people. It's a massive church. And it's meeting every day, and the, the extent of its organization is incredible. It's such a large church that it's certain that it's not possible probably for them all to meet at the same time because literally it's thousands of people although they're getting near to the time when they're going to be dispersed but this church has grown astronomically and they have a practical problem the first thing that happened when people got saved and first 5,000 souls and 3,000 souls and then multitudes were added to the Lord was that people uh, began to worship together the Bible says daily in every house and in the synagogues, they preached Jesus Christ and they broke bread and they ate their bread with gladness and singleness of heart. And they also, uh, the Bible says the people that had things gave them. They came and if they had whatever they had, they brought it and they put it at the apostles' feet. And nobody said that anything that they had was their own. They shared things. Just if somebody had a need, then if this guy's like, well, it's not mine, it's the Lord's. Here you go. And uh, the apostles were the ones who had been responsible for the distribution for the necessity of the saints. In other words, taking care of the ministry needs of the church. And by ministry needs of the church, I mean just literally meeting people's needs. You study the scripture carefully, there are some obligations the church has. And one of them is mentioned in this Acts 6 passage. First of all, widows. Now, there are qualifications for widows. They're supposed to be widows indeed, meaning they're actually widows. They don't have indigent children who are deadbeats and won't take care of them. Uh, they don't have nephews or uh, they don't have someone that is um, supposed to be supporting them but won't take care of them. And they also have uh, the, the qualifying lifestyle. They're not gossips and wasting time and uh, going about uh, being busybodies and so forth, but they're godly and they're spiritual and they're serving the Lord. And if they have needs, the church is supposed to meet their needs. We wouldn't need a welfare system in the United States of America if we had believers that were in the church and if the church did right by the believers. It's incredible to me how much support there is in the church. We wouldn't need child care. Uh, we wouldn't need welfare. Uh, and to some degree, I think we wouldn't even need health care. You have saved medical professionals in the church, and you have individuals who have medical needs in the church, and, and they don't have the ability to take care of themselves, then those people who are brethren would take care of each other. And that's, it's not socialism, it's just the way that the church is. It's what, what family does, they take care of themselves. That's God's original intention. But any time you involve humans, good humans, the apostles who were chosen by Jesus himself in this instance, uh, you, you're going to have fault or you're going to have failure. And the apostles in the Acts church had legitimately failed to make sure that, they, that the Grecian widows were taken care of the same as the Hebrew widows were in the daily ministration. So he went around and, and ministered to the widows and met their needs. And the, 
the Grecian widows were overlooked, and the Grecians began to murmur against the Hebrews in the church. It became a serious known problem. And when they griped about it, the apostles didn't say, hey, who are you to talk about us? We're apostles. They said this is a problem, and they acknowledged it. And so then when the multitude was, was complaining about it, they called the multitude of disciples together. Notice in the text as well that everyone in the church is called a disciple. Everyone in the church is called a disciple. And so there's multitudes of disciples, and they all got together. And here we find actually a good precedent for congregational rule. In other words, who was in charge in the church? Well, the apostles absolutely were, right? They didn't have Acts. They didn't have Romans and First and Second Corinthians, Galatians and Ephesians. They didn't have the pastoral epistles. So how are they going to solve this? Well, they need the foundational gift to the church, which are the apostles. Present day, today, the apostles and the prophets are the Word of God, the Scripture. They didn't have that. They had the actual apostles. And so the Holy Spirit of God led the apostles to call together the congregation. And they said, Look ye out from among you. You see this? Verse 3, Wherefore, brethren, look ye out from among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. And so here's what the apostles told the multitudes. They said, pick some seven men from the congregation who are full of the Holy Ghost and full of wisdom. We need wise men and we need spirit-filled men and you select them from among you. That was the idea. So the apostles gave the solution to the people and the people's solution uh, was to find them. And the apostles said, uh, we're going to appoint them over this business. Now, let me just pause here just for a second. I don't like the word trustee in a church. Sometimes the word trustee is, uh, it is a cloak or it is a cover name for someone who is not qualified to be a deacon, but is going to be in charge of business. You know, the last thing in the world we need is someone who is business savvy, but not full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. A lot of times we want worldly wise. And listen, every church growth seminar you'll go to will tell you to adopt a secular business model. And they'll give you reasons why, hey, you know what? If you're going to be successful in the church, you need to have successful people. And so find successful people and put them in leadership. Now, I'm not saying really we ought to look for unsuccessful people, but the first qualification for someone is spirit-filled, spiritual, wise. And so we look for spiritual people full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. Why? Well, because you might get snookered if you're not wise. Honest truth of the matter is a lot of times in the church... Uh, we get taken advantage of it. We can't be guarded all the time to the degree where we never do anything. We always err on the side of inactivity because we're afraid of making a mistake and helping someone who isn't worthy or something like that. But you know, there's just nothing to displace. There's nothing like being having the Holy Ghost and Him leading you. Following the ordination of these deacons, immediately Stephen ends up going out and preaching the Gospel. Philip immediately is caught up by, led by the Holy Ghost out to Gaza. Remember, it preaches the gospel to the Ethiopian eunuch. And actually, we owe much of the preservation of our scripture to the church in Ethiopia as a result of that ministry that began by the deacon Philip, who was called an evangelist. And so it's pretty important to have spirit filled, spirit empowered. Man, Anthony, what in the world are you doing? Man, you plant yourself and stay there. You're distracting everybody. Thank you. All right. Uh, it's important to have people that are filled with the Holy Ghost. Why? Because if they are not filled with the Holy Spirit of God, my friend, then they can't do the main thing in the church, which is the work of the Holy Spirit. And so it's important for this qualification. Now, uh, you say, Pastor, do, when does a church need a deacon? Well, there's a precedent here in Acts, isn't there? And I said I've evolved somewhat in my desire to have deacons, but I've always understood that the church was, a, you know, at least uh, maybe fifteen to twenty thousand people, and by the time it had grown to that point, to that stage of spiritual growth, then they needed a deacon. We're not quite there yet. 
we're not quite 20,000 people. We're a little bit more than 12, but we're not a lot more uh, than 20,000 at this stage in time. And so a church having deacons simply because it's in office, well, I don't, I'm not going to say that isn't a good reason, that it's not an office of the church, or that there's not something lacking or missing in the church. But the notion that you have to have them, well, actually, they didn't need them until the apostles were overwhelmed with the ministering or the ministration in the church. That's important to realize. It is certainly true that the church came to the place where the apostles said, we cannot do this because if we do, we will not give, be able to give ourselves continue to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. Now, the word deacon means servant or minister. And the apostles said, we are also servants or ministers, but we want to minister the Word. And we want to minister in prayer. And so those are the two things that the apostles saw as their primary calling, and they felt as though if we did the other things... And if we really dealt with this issue that the that the Grecian widow or the Grecians have issue of, then we would do a disservice in the in the matter in the area of preaching and in prayer. Okay, now, uh, what did they do? Well, they ordained them, and uh, verse six. Look down after they selected these men. Who selected the men? Do we answer that question? Who? The multitude or the congregation, right? The congregation selected those men. Okay, so that's the biblical precedent. Okay, um, in verse 6, the Bible says, Whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them, and the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. And so we see results, actually. The apostles ordained deacons. When they say they uh, set, they laid their hands on them, uh, that, that's ordination. That's literally, uh, that's not imparting the power of the Holy Ghost, but it is literally imparting the gift or recognizing the gift. I take very seriously ordination. Matter of fact, I, I don't think you'll probably ever see one of my degrees posted on a wall somewhere, but you will see, if you ever see an office uh, that, I, that I'm in, you will see my ordination certificate because I take that very seriously. In other words, the men that I recognize God had called and put His power on their life and God had specifically called to the preaching of the Word, I coveted their laying hands on me and recognizing the gift that was in me uh, for ordination as well. Come on in. You, we're looking for uh, Darrell? No. Oh, okay. Yeah, come on in. Oh, it's Daniel's mom. Okay. Uh, so I took that very seriously. That was a that was a not just a, a, an important matter, but it was a really important matter for me. Uh, th this question gets asked at every ordination. If we decide today not to ordain you, what will you do? And the correct answer is, I'm God called, and I you know if a man doesn't recognize God's call in my life, I'm going to preach the gospel anyway, and I'm going to go ahead and pastor anyway. Well, I actually. Uh, actually, my answer when they asked me that question, I said, well, you know something? I recognize God's call on the men that I've asked to sit on my ordination council. And if they think that there's a reason why I ought not be ordained to the gospel ministry, then I want to hear it. If they don't want to be ordained, if they don't want to ordain me, they don't feel led to ordain me, then there's something wrong. And that needs to be the matter I deal with first of all. And so I understand being called by God, but listen, if if Godly people don't recognize God's call in your life, my friend. You're operating in a vacuum or in a vapor. And your call is not legitimate. Your call is one that is to feed your own vanity and to, uh, and to promote your own self. And so it's an important matter. So the apostles laid hands on them. And then the Bible says, And, verse 7, the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith, and Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Now let me ask you a question. After the apostles ordained the men that the congregation or the multitude selected among them, did the church increase stay the same, remain the same, or decrease? 
and increase. Matter of fact, the word multiplication is used. And so literally, the selecting of deacons allowed the gospel to be multiplied. Apostles are foundational gifts, and I don't have time to preach specifically on the gift of the apostle this evening, but it is a cessation gift. And it is one of the, the gift of the apostle fits into that category in 1 Corinthians 13 when the Bible says, Whether the prophecies they shall cease, whether it be knowledge it shall vanish away. Uh, we recognize that apostles in Acts chapter 2, the qualification for them was that they had to be eyewitnesses of the resurrection. And Paul really articulated that as well when he explained the special circumstances by which he saw the resurrected Savior. And the other apostles acknowledged Paul's apostleship as well. In other words, they validated the same. And so an apostle was a first generation, first century gift, but once we had the completed word of God, then the whole matter of apostleship, the office of the apostles, was unnecessary. You say, I'm not sure about that, Pastor. Well, explain to me this then. Why is it when Paul was on his way to Jerusalem and one of the latter of the apostles, the later surviving apostles, why is it when he was on his way to Jerusalem knowing that he ultimately would be put to death that he called all the pastors of the churches around Ephesus and gave them really the marching orders or the next generation? Why didn't he ordain new apostles? Why didn't he say to the pastors, okay, I'm not going to be with you very much longer, so here's what you're going to have to do when the apostles are gone. You see, the apostles were a first century gift. They were a foundational, organizational gift to the church. And, but they were a gift that also ceased. And so, the, if you go to 1 Timothy chapter 3, uh, well, I want to see the second point that I want to see, uh, look at this evening. And it really is, it is uh, complementary to what we just saw a moment ago, and that is that the ordination of deacons in the church led to an increase or a multiplication of the effectiveness of the church. Do you see that in the text? It's pretty clear, isn't it? And so, one of the benefits of the deacons is that they were able to see the church multiply. Now, this isn't the only other place in the Scripture that this is dealt with, but we see in 1 Timothy chapter 3 qualifications for a bishop. If you were to go to, to uh, Titus, we're not going to this evening, but if you go to Titus, you would see that the word bishop and elder are used interchangeably. In other words, in the same context, first they're called bishops, and then they're called elders. When Paul was told to uh, ordain, or Paul was telling Timothy to ordain elders in every city out of the Cretans who are uh, liars, evil beasts, slow bellies, lousy people. And when Paul told Timothy to ordain elders, he also referred to them also as pastor. So pastor, bishop, and elder are all interchangeable titles in the New Testament. And that doesn't take a rocket scientist. Strange denominational preferences that have to do with hierarchy evolve when you try to make something different out of elder, pastor, and bishop, but they're used interchangeably in the, in the scripture, and so they're just descriptive words. In other words, an elder ought to be a pastor. You know what a pastor means, right? It means shepherd, so an elder ought to shepherd. A bishop ought to be an elder, and an elder ought to be a bishop, and a bishop ought to be a pastor. They're just three different applications of the same office. But we do see in chapter 3 and verse 1 of 1 Timothy that there are offices in their church, namely two, that you'll see in the Scripture. Some individuals would like to argue from Ephesians chapter 4 that there is also the office of the evangelist. And I'm not here this evening to pick on the evangelist. There certainly is the, the, uh, the need for the evangelist in the church, the person, the evangelist. But it is not an actual office in the church. I think it's a complementary office. I think oftentimes uh, the deacon is the evangelist, as in the case of Philip. Remember, Philip was ordained to be a, a deacon. What did he do? He went off and preached the gospel, and then he got called Philip the evangelist. And so uh, an evangelist is a Christian, I think. It's a descriptor for the Christian. I've done a great deal of study on that. And I have evangelist friends who I wouldn't for the world offend by saying that evangelist is not an office. Honestly, it's like splitting hairs if, if you like to, to see it that way. I believe in the gift of the evangelist. And so I call it a gift. Some people call it an office. But it's not called an office anywhere in the Scripture. And that's the only problem with that. But there are two offices that are called offices in the Scripture. And those would be in 1 Timothy chapter 3. This is a true saying. 
if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be, okay, and here's the qualifications, blameless, the husband of life, vigilant, sober, of good behavior. I think it says in here a prankster too. But given to hospitality and apt to teach. Not given to wine, no striker, not guilty of guilt, greedy of filthy lucre. When I say guilty, that's a good word, isn't it? Not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. The reason being, for if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Pretty good point. Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. And so in verse 7, moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. And then we see in verse 8, what is that word? Likewise. likewise. What does likewise mean? Just Similar to, in the same manner as, or just the same as. Just like you see in passages of the Scripture where the Bible is talking about behavior for servants and masters, likewise, and husbands, and likewise, wives, and likewise, children, and it's talking about submission in each of those instances, we see the word likewise used here. And so the word likewise in this instance is everything that's required of a pastor is actually required of a deacon. Now you say, Pastor, boy, that's laying a lot on because then deacons are going to get things in addition. No, actually, it's just the same requirements. In other words, you couldn't argue that any of the requirements for a pastor wouldn't be good requirements for the Christian in general, would you? In other words, these conditions that a pastor must meet are conditions that anyone ought to know ought to represent a Christian, but a pastor ought to be a good Christian. If you're going to fulfill the office of pastor, you ought to be a, you ought to be a good Christian. And if you're going to fulfill the office of a deacon, likewise... You need to be a good Christian, and so there are qualifications. Again, this brings me to why it is that some churches have trustees. In some of these areas, deacons or men who are appointed to the same office don't qualify for the office, and so churches have a way of doing the same thing and calling it something else. Here's the deal with that, though. Why elect? And, uh, I mean, here, here's the question. Can God use anybody regardless of their past? Can He? Does God forgive? Yes. 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 When God forgives, uh, can a Christian, again, be useful? The answer is yes. But when God forgives some of these things, can a Christian be a pastor? And the answer is no. Can a Christian be a deacon? And the answer is no. They can't. Why? Well, because of the testimony's sake. You say, well, that's harsh. Well, the good thing about it is that God's got it all handled. In other words... If you've disqualified yourself from being a pastor or for being a deacon, God can forgive you and God can have a purpose in your life. And to say that because I cannot be a deacon or because I cannot be a pastor, my life isn't worth living, is to really insult anyone who's not a pastor or a deacon, if you think of it, from that perspective. Does God call everyone to be pastor and deacon? No, no He does not. And you can meet all the qualifications to be a pastor and deacon and never, and never be... Uh, ordained as one or called to be one. You see this? Uh, there's nothing wrong with not being one of these things. The notion that my life cannot be complete unless I fulfill this office is ridiculous. It's like saying unless I can be an astronaut or unless I can be a rocket surgeon, then I have no purpose in life. No, my friend, unless you're what God made you to be, then you have no purpose. But it's a sure thing that God didn't make you to be a pastor or a deacon or sometimes a rocket surgeon, depending on the case. Okay, the reality of it is, though, that, that uh, here are some things for deacons looking at verse 8, and we'll complement our second point and be finished. Verse 8, the Bible says, Likewise must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given too much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre. Okay, so he doesn't speak out of both sides of his mouth. In verse 9, holding the mystery of the faith in pure conscience. And so he needs to be faithful. In verse 10, and let these also first be proved. Then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. Well, how do you test someone for the office of a deacon? Well, actually just have them do what a deacon does. And if they do a great job of it, after a while you realize that guy's a deacon. He just hasn't been ordained. 
And I've said this many times in our church, we don't have duly ordained deacons yet, but we do have men that serve in those positions actually. In other words, they do the things, and they qualify to do the things. It's just that, you know, we just said, well, if it's being done, what's the point in, you know, making something happen? But there may be a point, and I want to look at that in just a second here. And verse 11, the Bible says, Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children their own house as well. And then verse 13, For they that have used the office of a deacon well, purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Now, I just want to stop here, and I want to elaborate on verse 13 using two known examples in the New Testament. What lit Stephen's fuse? Why didn't a guy go nuts and start doing miracles and preaching the gospel until he got rocked to death? When did it happen? After he was ordained to be a deacon. In other words, for Stephen, something about... That appointment, I do believe that being a deacon was a full-time job. If the apostles didn't have time to do it full-time, and they appointed seven people to do it, I believe it was a full-time job. So it would be very similar what today to what today we call an assistant pastor. In other words, he may not have the preaching role in the church, but he does a lot of the ministry in the church or handles it. Some, some churches have like a finance guy or directors of different ministries, and that guy would probably be a deacon. And in this instance, what happened to a couple of the deacons was they, I mean, it's a good thing it didn't happen to all of them. They didn't need it to replace the deacons instantly. But Stephen just, it's like they lit, a, lit his fuse and the man just was a bomb. He just, boom! He just blew up. And I mean that in a positive way. I mean, he started preaching the gospel with power and he started preaching with boldness and he went in the, into the synagogue and he ticked everybody off, and he preached the gospel. One of the best messages, probably the second best message in the New Testament. Uh, I think Peter's is the best message preached. But then Stephen's is like the second best message ever preached. And uh, boy, he lit it up, and they, uh, they lit him up. <laughs> they rocked him to death. And then the persecution began, and the church went to the next level by preaching the gospel around the world and reaching the Gentiles. And Stephen was the catalyst and the thing that set Stephen off was that he got ordained. Philip got ordained, and man, he went to Samaria and preached the gospel, and the whole town got saved. And then he left there, and the Holy Spirit said, go out in the desert, and found a, a man riding in a chariot, joined himself to the chariot, preached the gospel to the Ethiopian eunuch, and the whole region of Ethiopia became believers. We don't hear much more about Philip after that. What lit those guys' fires? Well, I believe the laying on of hands. The ordination to be deacons. And so you ask, Pastor, what are the benefits of being a deacon? Well, I just think that there's something God does when a person uses the office well. Desires like a pastor, a man desiring the office of a bishop. And uh, when a man is ordained to be a deacon, it just seems as though first... Timothy 3, verse 13 says, They that have used the office of a deacon well purchased to themselves a good degree, and notice the next phrase, and great, what's the next word? Boldness. Boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. You say, Pastor, how does that work? How in the world does getting ordained to be a deacon uh, make a guy bold? Well, Acts tells us how. I don't know. It happens. And so it seems as though there's something clearly indicated in the Scripture that's a benefit uh, of being a deacon. I just want to share that with us this evening. I want us to understand how we get a pastor. Well, we look for scriptural, biblical qualifications. We choose them, normally, out of the congregation. In Titus... Timothy is told to choose ordained pastors, elders, out of the cities that they come from. So you're supposed to find someone there. They're supposed to meet the qualifications and be ordained as elders. So how do we get pastors? Well, they come, out, they come from out from among the congregation. How do we get deacons? Well, they come from out from among the congregation. And so I hope that that's a help to you this evening to know how it is that a church 
uh, get Stevens. Let me finish with just a couple of uh, thoughts or just share some experiences that we've had. I have found that this matter of deacons has not been an issue at all with the congregation of members in our church. But I have found that outsiders uh, and their notions about deacons have some very problematic, troublesome ways with how they understand and use the office of a deacon. For instance, uh, on more than one occasion, individuals have come to this church seeking the office of a deacon. In other words, a man began visiting our church some years ago. He called and said, you know, I'm thinking about visiting your church. I go to go such and such church in the area and I'm having some issues there. I'm thinking about coming to your church. And he let me know. He says, you know, I'm a deacon. I'm a deacon in our church. And so when he came to our church, he said, so uh, who, who are the deacons here? And I said, well, you know, <laughs> we don't really have deacons yet. Why don't you have deacons? And um, I said, well, we don't quite have, you know, 20,000 people yet. And uh, so we haven't needed them so much. We've just got guys that handle the things that deacons do, and we haven't had to ordain them. And he said, well, why, what do you have against deacons? So I don't have anything against having a deacon. If the Lord led us to do it, I'd be satisfied doing it. I'd feel, you know, if there was a reason to, I'd feel uh, happy to do so. I'd be happy to ordain a deacon in our church. And this same individual came for a while and seemed to you know, fit and go pretty well. But I noticed there was a little bit of resentment uh, that he had toward me and a little resentment that he had toward the leadership in our church. And you could tell he wanted to be leadership. And I did a little investigation on him with a couple of pastors who pastored him in the past. They said, yeah, that man's trouble. He wants to come in the church and he wants to take charge and he wants to run the show. And uh, he stopped coming after very long. And I called him up and I asked him, I said, is there anything wrong? And he said, well, he said, you know, he said, you know, I just don't like the way you guys run things over there. And I said, well, well, what do you mean? I said, we're pretty open. We're pretty open to criticism. And he said, well, you guys need to have deacons. And uh, I said, well, I suppose you'd like to be the deacon, wouldn't you? And of course he would. You know, he wants to be the deacon. Why does he want to be the deacon? He wasn't serving anybody in the church. He wasn't doing what the Bible says you're supposed to do before you become a deacon. He wasn't going about serving people and you, you know, performing the office of a deacon and then became ordained as a deacon. No, he wanted to come in and be the boss. He wanted to be the guy that <laughs> ran the finances and made the uh, direction, leadership decisions and ultimately told the, church, the pastor what to do. Uh, the elder-led churches are that way individuals that really are deacons are actually ordained as elders and you know what they're responsible for actually <laughs> they're responsible for hiring and firing the pastor to the exclusion of the congregation I have seen elder run churches run pastors in and out of town I mean just they the congregation loves the pastor and things are going well and, and uh, one of the elders gets a little beef with them and he gets, starts talking to two other elders and pretty soon they have a meeting Nobody knows about it. Next thing you know, the pastor sent packing. And the congregation has nothing to do with it. And friend, the congregation is supposed to have everything to do with it. And so it's not the biblical scriptural way of uh, finding a pastor or finding a deacon. I'm fine with having leadership to search out a pastor. But you know, I think that the best case scenario for any church, and I've seen it actually carry out and work well in transition, would be for a pastor to grow up in the church and for them to be taught to sit under a pastor, be under authority, demonstrate that the same authority they want to hold, they can be under themselves. And that they uh, are servants in the same way that uh, they want to serve. And so, anyway, those are some caveats or some a little bit of personal commentary on the office of a deacon. Somebody that has a real problem with not being a deacon is not qualified to be a deacon. Because a deacon is a servant. And I'll be honest with you, serving isn't the most popular office around. Now, there are some folks, there are some folks that do love to serve. There are some Christians who love to serve. I mean, honestly, it just thrills them. If they had an opportunity to do something for somebody and to really just to come under and just serve somebody, it's really their gift. And it's really what they do. And I'd say that'd be a person that you want to be your deacon because the guy that wants to serve doesn't want to boss anybody. 
He doesn't want to manage anybody. He doesn't want to tell the church, you know, this is what everybody's doing wrong, and this is why God anointed me to be your director and to give you direction. No, we do that as a congregation, don't we? And we follow the leadership that God's given us as a pastor. And we don't need somebody to boss us. You know, the reality of it is, is that we really don't need somebody to boss us, do we? You say, well, some, sometimes we do. No, we need authority. But the reality of it is, is that bosses aren't very helpful in that sense. You know what I'm talking about? Sometimes people come to me and say, Pastor, you really ought to. And I just think, yeah, I'll fit that extra 20 hours a week in my schedule. <laughs> sure, you betcha. That'll, that'll work. You know, Pastor, you should. And you know what that is? That's a boss. That's somebody telling you what to do. And you know what we need? <laughs> we need to serve the Lord. And what we need are servants to help us do things, not tell us to do things. Now, I'm not speaking about if we're out of sorts or if we're not serving. You're not serving the Lord. And you have someone that comes alongside and says, you know, you really need to think about what kind of a church member you are. And, uh, you know, this church has a lot of areas that we are just being overwhelmed and you're not carrying the load. Help us. Well, that's different than bossing, isn't it? That's saying, you know, help us carry the load. Grab a hold. Hold the rope. You know, you're leaving us in a lurch. And so that's the office of a deacon. And so let me just recap so we know. We looked at this evening how a church gets a deacon and what the deacon does. And then secondly, we looked at the benefits of having a deacon. The benefits of the deacon in Acts were that the church was multiplied as a result of it. And the benefit in 1 Timothy chapter 3 is that the deacon personally benefited by having more boldness and by God just doing an amazing work. In other words, taking His ministry to the next level. Want to be a deacon? Well, those would be the right reasons to desire the office of a deacon. Father, thank You for what You taught us this evening. And I just pray that You would lead us as a church in our future in this matter. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank You. You're dismissed.